In this video, we will cover the core content you need to know for NMR spectra on the MCAT, starting with what NMR is and what it's used for. NMR spectroscopy is an analytic technique used to identify the molecular structure of a molecule. This is accomplished by analyzing the magnetic fields around atoms within a molecule. While different types of NMR spectra exist, we will only focus on HNMR, which looks at the hydrogen atoms within a molecule since it is the most commonly seen on the MCAT. Ultimately, understanding how NMR spectra work is unnecessary, as it is rather complicated and the MCAT focuses on the interpretation of NMR spectra rather than the ins and outs of the technique itself. Specifically, you need to know how to identify and interpret four components of an NMR spectrum, the number of signals, the splitting pattern of those signals, the integration of a signal, and the shifting pattern of signals. We will begin by learning about signals or the number of distinct peaks seen on a spectrum as indicated by the different colored peaks here. Each signal is produced by unique or chemically distinct hydrogens, so if a molecule has three unique hydrogens, then it will produce three distinct signals on an NMR spectra. We can determine whether or not a hydrogen is unique by looking at symmetry. For example, if we draw a vertical symmetry line down the center of pentane shown here, we can see that the pentane molecule is mirrored across this line. Therefore, the hydrogens that are mirrored across this line are chemically identical to one another. Since this molecule isn't cyclic or branched, we don't need to draw a horizontal symmetry line as all hydrogens on the same carbon atom will also be identical to one another. In this case, pentane has three unique hydrogens and will therefore produce three distinct signals, one for each of the unique hydrogens. Now that we have seen one example of how this works, let's look at a couple more examples and a sample question. To begin, we will first identify where hydrogens are present on cyclohexanone by counting the number of bonds each carbon has. Since carbon wants to have four bonds in total, any bonds not shown represent hydrogen bonds. Let's start with the carbonyl at the top of the molecule. The carbonyl carbon molecule already has four bonds, two to oxygen and two to the adjacent carbon atoms, so it doesn't have any hydrogen bonds. Moving clockwise, the next carbon only has two bonds, one to each adjacent carbon atom. Therefore, it will have two hydrogens attached to it. Let's draw those in. The remainder of the carbons in the molecule also have two hydrogens, since they only possess two bonds to each adjacent carbon atom. Now that we know where hydrogen atoms are, let's start with our vertical symmetry line. Here we can see that this molecule is mirrored across this line, therefore the hydrogens mirrored on either side will be identical. Since this molecule is cyclic, we will also need to draw a horizontal symmetry line. When we draw this line, we can see that the molecule isn't mirrored across this line, therefore the hydrogens across this line will be unique. In total, there are three unique hydrogens, and therefore the NMR spectrum for this molecule would have a total of three unique signals. Now let's look at a different molecule, specifically chloropentane. For this molecule, we will only need to draw a vertical symmetry line, since it's linear and unbranched. When we draw this line, we can now see that this molecule is not mirrored across this line, and therefore all the hydrogens here will be unique. Here, there are a total of five unique hydrogens, as all of the carbons have less than four bonds displayed, and as such, will have a total of five distinct signals on its NMR spectrum. Now that we've seen how to find the number of signals of a molecule, let's look at two sample problems. This question asks, how many signals would show up on the HNMR spectra of one chloropenta 2 ohm? Since this molecule is linear, we only need to draw one symmetry line, in this case a vertical one. Again, we can see that this molecule isn't mirrored across this line, therefore all of the hydrogens in this molecule will be unique. All of the carbons, excluding the carbonyl carbon, will have hydrogen, so in total we will have four unique hydrogens, and therefore four signals making answer choice C correct. Now, let's try this next problem without drawing a symmetry line, since we ultimately want to be able to answer these questions without having to redraw the entire molecule. This question asks, how many signals would show up on the HNMR spectra of 3 pentanone? Since this molecule is linear and unbranched, we only need to consider symmetry from one perspective, in this case, across an imagined vertical symmetry line. Across this line, the molecule is symmetrical, thus the hydrogens mirrored across this molecule will also be identical. If you're having a hard time picturing this, don't worry, just keep practicing drawing your symmetry lines, and eventually this technique will be intuitive. Let's go ahead and draw everything out so we can make sure that we are 100% correct in terms of what we did in our head. Only the central carbonyl carbon will lack hydrogens, so in total here, there will be two unique hydrogens and thus two signals in the NMR spectrum of this molecule, making answer choice A correct. Now that we have learned about signals, let's turn our attention to splits, or how many individual peaks comprise the different signals. For example, on the NMR spectrum here, the blue signal is split into three peaks, referred to as a triplet. The splits occur because of adjacent hydrogens or hydrogens on an atom one away. For example, in pentane, shown here, the blue signal should have three distinct splits, one for the blue hydrogens, and additional due to the effects of the two adjacent red hydrogens. Whereas the red signal corresponding to the red hydrogens shown in pentane should have a total of six splits, one for the red hydrogens, and five additional for the two adjacent yellow hydrogens, and another three for the adjacent blue hydrogens. This is where the splits equals n plus 1 rule comes from, where the number of splits will be equal to the n number of adjacent hydrogens plus 1 for the unique hydrogen being described. 
Now that we know how splitting patterns work, let's put everything together and answer another question. Here this question asks, which of the following NMR spectra corresponds to two pentanone? Looking at our answer choices, a couple things stand out. First, there are different amounts of signals in the different spectra. Two have a total of four, and the other two have a total of three. This means we can begin by thinking about how many unique hydrogens this molecule has. Since this molecule is linear and unbranched, we only need one symmetry line, specifically a vertical one. This molecule isn't symmetrical, therefore all of the hydrogens on the different carbon atoms will be unique. In total, there are four unique hydrogens, so we can eliminate the answer choices that only contain three signals. From there, we will turn towards the second difference, the number of splits in one of the signals. One contains three splits, and the other contains six. While we could go through each and every hydrogen and determine the splitting pattern for each, that isn't necessary. Instead, we can look at the hydrogen that contains the most adjacent hydrogens, since six splits is a lot and would correspond to a lot of neighboring hydrogen atoms. In that case, this would be these hydrogens here. In total, they have five neighboring hydrogen atoms, and therefore we should see a total of six splits for our largest splitting pattern. Therefore, the answer displaying six splits is correct. Now that we have learned about signals and splits, let's discuss integration, which describes how tall each of the signals is and corresponds to the amount of a particular unique hydrogen. For example, the red signal has the tallest peak, meaning there will be far more red hydrogens in the molecule in comparison to the hydrogens that represent both the yellow and blue signals. In the case of pentane, there are a total of six unique blue hydrogens, four unique red hydrogens, and only two unique yellow hydrogens. The integration for the blue hydrogens is the largest, and therefore that signal should be the tallest as seen here. Keep in mind that we only pay attention to the tallest split for each signal. From there, the red signal should be the second largest, and lastly, the yellow signal should be the shortest. Now let's look at a practice problem to see how we can apply this information. In this question, we are asked which labeled hydrogen in ethyl acetate corresponds to the four ppm shift shown in the NMR spectra for ethyl acetate. Since there are three signals, the three hydrogens in this molecule must be unique, and therefore we don't need to spend any additional time determining signal information. Now we will turn to integration. Since we were asked to find the shortest signal of the three seen on the NMR spectrum near the four on the x-axis, we will look for the hydrogen that contains the smallest number of unique hydrogens. In this case, there are three HA hydrogens, two HB hydrogens, and three HC hydrogens. Therefore, the four ppm shift has to correspond to HB since it is the shortest signal and therefore it will have the fewest number of HB hydrogens present in the molecule in comparison to both HA and HC. Now that we've discussed the signal splits and integration, we will turn to shifts, or how far away a signal is from zero. For example, the blue signal is hardly shifted, while the red signal is shifted a great deal. Shifts are measured in comparison to a baseline molecule called TMS, which will always show up at zero. So if you ever see a signal at zero that isn't coming from the specific molecule being analyzed, but instead from TMS. These shifts are dependent on two molecular features, electronegative atoms and unsaturated groups. When these groups are present, they deshield or pull electron density away from nearby hydrogens. Deshielding moves that specific hydrogen hydrogen signal to the left or downfield on the NMR spectra. Generally, the closer the hydrogen atom is to one of these features, the greater the degree of shifting. For example, the red signal here would be coming from a hydrogen close to either an electronegative atom or an unsaturated group. If these groups are absent, as is the case with an alkyne, then the electron shielding occurs and the signal will show up further upfield or to the right in the NMR spectrum. While there are specific shifts for a bunch of different types of groups, it is far more important to understand how these shifts occur and a couple of notable landmark values rather than trying to memorize a giant list of them. With this in mind, let's recap what you should know, then discuss the specific important shifts. Downfield shifts move signals to the left and are due to deshielding by either electronegative atoms or unsaturated groups. The D in both downfield and deshielding can help you remember that these two go together. So which shifts should you know? Ideally, you would know all of them, but that is somewhat unrealistic considering how much there is to know for the MCAT, and the likelihood of this information showing up on your test is quite low. Even still, it's beneficial to know a couple benchmarks. Let's start with the least shifted group, the alkanes. These will generally show up around 1 to 2 ppm. After that, the halides tend to range from 2.5 ppm to 4.5 ppm. Then from there, aromatic hydrogen shifts quite a bit more due to unsaturation and end up around 6 ppm to roughly 9 ppm. Lastly, aldehydes are around 9 to 10 ppm and carboxylic acids are the most shifted group ranging from 10 ppm to 13 ppm. We can then use these benchmarks to estimate other groups. For example, we would expect alkenes to be a bit more shifted than alkanes and for hydrogens of carbon atoms near oxygen to be shifted similarly to those of the halides. This isn't foolproof, but chances are this will be enough for the MCAT as the focus of this test tends to be on concepts rather than specifics. Now that we've learned about shifts, let's apply what we know to a question and learn a little bit about a specific type of question, the 2x2. Two 
This question asks, the NMR spectra of chloroethane shows two signals, one at 1.5 ppm and one at 3.5 ppm. Which of the following labeled hydrogen corresponds to the 3.5 ppm shift? And this is a two by two question because the answer choice alternate two specific options twice. For example, we will decide whether the hydrogen being further or closer matters and whether or not this is represented by shielding or deshielding. I find it's easiest to tackle each part of a two by two question separately since it can be easy to get these answer choices mixed up with one another. We will use a grid so we can visualize our approach and label the top part with shielded or deshielded and the left with further or closer. Let's look at shielding first. Since the question mentioned two shifts, 1.5 and 3.5, and we are identifying the shift further downfield, then we must be looking for an answer choice that indicates greater deshielding. So any answer choice that includes shielding is therefore incorrect. From there, we can now look at the distance from the chlorine atom and how this affects shifting. The closer you are to an electronegative atom, such as chlorine, the greater the effect of shifting. Therefore, the 3.5 ppm shift has to be HB since we'll experience greater deshielding and therefore end up further downfield. From here, we can go ahead and select our correct answer by looking for HB and the one that states that it is closer. In total, we learned about the four key features you need to be able to identify on an NMR spectrum. The number of signals, which corresponds to the number of unique hydrogens, the splitting pattern of those signals due to adjacent hydrogens, the integration or the height of the signals, which tells us about how much of each unique hydrogen is present in a molecule, and lastly, the shifts of those signals due to electronegative or unsaturated groups within an atom. If you found this video helpful, make sure to like and subscribe for more useful MCAT tips and share it with anybody else who might be taking the test.